Hi, in this Let's Create series we're implementing the core game mechanic for a range of simple games. In this episode we're going to implement Whack-A-Mole. You have to click on the moles before they disappear to gain time, and if you miss them you lose time. But whatever you do, don't click on the bombs as that's game over. Let's get started. When creating a new game it's important that it's fun, so getting a playable prototype as soon as possible is important. As such, this is what I think the smallest minimum file product for Whack-A-Mole is. First, we need a button to start a game. Second, we need a game board of a 3x3 grid of mole holes. Third, we have a timer with 30 seconds on it. Fourth, the moles pop up and you have to tap on them to remove them, where getting a mole adds some time and missing a mole removes time. On game over, we can start again. Whilst that would work, it would be a bit dull. So we want to add a few more steps without overscoping the game and getting carried away. So I'll add in three extra little bits that will add fun to the game. We'll add hitting a bomb is an instant fail, and moles with hard hats require two taps instead of one. And finally, it gets harder as you progress. With that in mind, I spent far too long creating these beauties so you don't have to. We have the standard mole, the version when you hit them, the hard hat mole, which gains cracks after one tap, and then the hit version. And finally, a bomb which is actually four images with slightly different bits on the sparks so we can animate it. I'm not a graphic artist by any stretch, but I think they came out okay. So let's open Unity and get started with a standard 2D project called Whack-A-Mole. We'll start by focusing on creating the logic for an individual mole. Create a sprites folder and drop in all the image files you want to use for the moles. I've also included the ever favorite one pixel white square, which we'll need later. We'll start with an empty game object to house all the components of our mole. To this, we'll add our mole graphic, and then the two halves of the mole hole. This is split in two because we want our mole to be able to disappear down it. As such, the background is on the back part, and the front part is just the front soil bit. We need to order the sprites so they're in the right layers. We do this with the order in layer property. We'll set the back of the hole to be 0, so it's at the back, the mole to be 1, and the front to be 2. Looking good so far. However, when our mole disappears down the hole, you can see them peeking out of the bottom, and we don't want that. So we need to add a sprite mask. We can use the create menu to add a 2D sprite mask. To this, we'll add our 1 pixel white square, and we'll scale it up to 256 so it matches the size of our mole sprites. This gives us a completely opaque sprite mask. Now back on the mole, in the sprite renderer section, there is a mask interaction option. We want the mole to be visible whenever it is inside the mask, so we select this. Now, when you drag the mole down, it cuts off the mole outside of the sprite mask. There is one slight issue with this. Let's duplicate our mole. Now, when they're positioned above each other like this, then when the top mole comes down, it gets cut off correctly, but when the sprite hits the sprite mask of the one below it, it starts to show again, and we don't want that. Luckily, this is an easy fix. To the parent game object, we'll add a sorting group. This groups all the sprite rendering actions in this object and all its children together, so they're processed in one go, which means the sprite mask will not affect any other sprites outside this game object. Now when we move the mole, he disappears as expected. Now for some logic. All the actions revolve around the mole sprite. The other things aren't going to change, so we'll add our mole script to this object. Let's just quickly create a script directory and drag the script in there. So the first bit of logic we want to do is animate the mole popping up, waiting a bit, then popping down again. We know these values, so we'll just hard code them in. The end position is when it pops up, and we know that that's zero as we centered the sprite. The start position will be minus 2.56 in the y coordinate. This is because our sprites are 256 pixels high, and the default pixels per unit in Unity is 100. So 256 divided by 100 is 2.56. We also want a parameter for how long it takes to do the show hide animation. So we'll set that to half a second. Finally, we'll have a variable for the duration. This is how long the mall stays visible for. The show hide function is an iron numerator as we're going to start this with a coroutine. We'll pass in the start end positions too. In our showing part of the logic, we want the sprite to start at the start and end at the end. So we just need to worry about the middle bit. 
For this, it's the standard alert loop that you'll have likely seen before. We track the amount of time that has elapsed, and we use a while loop to keep going until that equals our duration. We set our local position to be the linear interpolation, lerp, between the start and end point, based on the percentage of the duration that has elapsed. We update the elapsed time and yield null so that it immediately returns and loops again. Once that's done, we're going to wait in our shown state for our duration, then we'll hide them all, and this is exactly the same code as before, with the start and end variables reversed in the lerp. While we're testing, we'll just call this coroutine from the start method so we can see it in action. If we take a look at this in Unity, we can now see our more pop up and down. Excellent. Now we'll implement the logic for what happens when we click on the mall. For this, we'll need to add a box collider 2D to our sprite so it can register the click. Then in the code, we can implement our logic in the on mouse down method. When we tap on the mall, we want the sprite to change, the current animation to stop so it stays in position for a little bit, and then to hide it. So we'll need references to the sprites. Let's add them all whilst we're here. We'll also add a reference to our sprite renderer so we can change it and get the component in the awake method. So now in our onMouse down function, we can change our sprite to the hit version. We'll stop all the coroutines, there will be only one, and we'll start a new one called quick hide to hide it in a moment. What we don't want to be able to do is keep clicking on this, so we'll add a ball called hittable, which we'll check on click and set to false when we've already clicked it. The quick hide method simply waits for a quarter of a second and then this called the hide method, which simply sets the location to the starting position. We'll add a little bit of a guard around the hide method and check it's not hittable, just in case the mall has been spawned again by the game before this coroutine hits. It's probably not necessary. Looking at this back in Unity, we'll assign all the sprites to the variables. When we click it, it all works fine. Excellent. Next on our list is the ability to change the mole type. So we'll create a mole type enum for our three cases. In the local variable to store which one we currently are. We'll need another variable hard rate to indicate how often we want a hard hat version and an integer lives because we want the hard hat to have two lives. So in our start method before we call show hide we'll call a new method create next. In here we'll create a random number between 0 and 1. If it's less than our hard hat rate we'll set the type to the hard hat and then set the appropriate sprite and set lives to 2 else we'll set it to the standard mole. In this function, we also set the hittable variable to true, so it's reset each time we create a new mole. Back in our onMouseDown method, we can wrap our existing code within the switch statement for the standard mole type, and for the new hard mode, if the number of lives is currently two, we want the broken sprite, and to reduce the number of lives, in that case, we set the sprite to the dead version, and like for standard, we stop the animation, call the delayed hide function, and set hittable to false. We'll sort the bomb stuff out in a minute. In Unity, we can check that works. Here we've got a hard hat, and it takes two clicks to get them. Excellent. So we've just got the bomb left to add. Unlike our other sprites, this isn't a single instance. We've got an animation we want to show. The quickest way to create an animation is to drag all the sprites into the game, and it'll create it for us. We can just name this bomb animation, and we'll whack them in the animations folder. Now we don't need a whole object, we can just take the animation component. So I'll copy that and paste that onto our mole. We'll turn the animate off for now. We can now get rid of that bomb object. And then in the game, whenever the animation controller is turned on, then the sprite is automatically updated for us with the bomb element. So we can use this to control the logic for us. So just like our sprite renderer, we'll have a variable to store our reference to the animator, which we'll populate in the awake method. Now, in our create next method, we'll add in a second random call to decide between a bomb and a mole. Just like for the hard hat rate, we'll have a variable bomb rate, which will say how often we're gonna have a bomb. Set the type and turn the animator on. The existing code for the moles remains unchanged, except for ensuring that we turn the animator off before we set the sprite. The final extra feature we want to add to the mole is to set a difficulty level. So create a new method called setLevel, which takes in an integer parameter. We'll use this level variable to alter all the parameters. For the bomb rate, we want no bombs at the start and a maximum of say 25% bombs at the end. In this case, we'll have the end level being level 10. So we'll increase the bomb rate by 2.5% every level, capping it at 25% using the min operator. 
Similarly, for the hard hat rate, we'll have no hard hats at the start and end up with 100% hard hats at level 40. You can, of course, change these arbitrary values I've used to alter the gameplay of your game. Finally, we want to change how long the mole stays visible for. We take the duration to be a random between two values. We'll set this to start with between 1 and 2 seconds and shrink it by 0.1 seconds each level. So at level 10, we'll have durations between 0 and 1. And at level 20, they'll be all staying for 0 seconds. I felt like 0 was a bit harsh, so set the minimum to be 0.01. You may want to push that a bit higher and ensure that it doesn't go negative by using the clamp method. And you could equally have used the max function here if you preferred. For now, we'll just set the level to 0 in our start function. That's the mole done by adding in the calls back to the game manager, which we'll add in as we require them later. However, there is a bug in how we've implemented this which would become apparent when you start playing the game. If we look in the scene view, what is happening when the mole is showing and hiding, you can see the green box is our box collider, which moves with the mole. Even though you can no longer see the mole, the collider is still there and can be clicked on. When the moles are arranged in a grid, the mole below may not be clickable, as the box collider for the top mole may overlap it if it's hidden. We could disable the collider, but we do want the mole to be clickable when it's appearing and disappearing. So what we need to do is resize it appropriately. So we'll add a variable to maintain our reference to the box collider 2D. We can change the size of the collider using the offset and size parameters. So we create variables to hold the values for these for when it is shown and for when it is hidden. We'll set the values to these in the awake method after getting the reference. We'll set the offset and size to be the original values. When hiding, we're just modifying the Y position. So we'll set that to half the start position which will place it at the base of the sprites. And the size when hidden will obviously be zero in the Y coordinate with X remaining the same. There are two places we need to modify these parameters. In the hide function, we'll set them to the hidden values. And in the show hide function, just like for the position, we linearly interpolate with alert functions between the hidden and visible values when we're showing it. Again, setting it exactly right after the animation to ensure it's in the right place. Then, when hiding, we do the opposite, interpolating between the visible and hidden values, again, setting them after. That's it. Back in Unity, we can now see that the collider is resizing appropriately when the mole is showing and hiding. So you'll only be able to click on the right portion of the mole. With our mole done, we can change the activation from start method to instead be a public activate method, which takes in the level as a parameter. Let's turn it into a prefab and move that to a new prefabs directory. Then we'll duplicate the moles and arrange them in a 3x3 grid like this. Whilst we're here, we'll add a play button to start the game. We'll add the text play game and anchor it to the bottom centre. Finally, we'll change the background colour by clicking on the camera to swap it from the blue to a brown to match the ground that our moles are in. So now, let's create the game logic. We'll create an empty game object called Game Manager and add a Game Manager script to it. Again, we'll move this to our scripts directory and keep things neat. The first thing we'll need is a list of the mole scripts so we can interact with them. We take a reference to the play button game object so we can hide that when we're playing. We want a variable to determine how much time we have left in the game, which I've called starting time, and set to 30 seconds. We'll need a variable to record how much time is remaining. When we're starting the mole animations, we want to keep track of which moles are already animating, so we can choose a different one. So we'll use a hash set for this of type mole called current moles. We want to track how we're doing, so we'll have an integer score, and finally, we'll have a boolean to indicate if we're playing the game or not. To set up the game, we'll start with a public method called start game. This is what will be called when we click on the play button. This hides the play button, then ensures all the moles are hidden to start with. Our set of used moles is empty, our time remaining is set to the starting time, our score is zero, and we set playing to true. Now we can handle the main game logic in the update method. If we are playing the game, we update the time remaining. If it's less than or equal to zero, then we're finished. We call the game over method, we pass zero as we want different messages to appear in different game ending scenarios. For now, that game over method will just set playing to false and show the play button again. 
If we're playing, then we check that the current number of moles active is less than however many we want, which I've simply taken to be the score divided by 10. So every 10 moles hit, there will be more moles appearing. To determine which mole to add, we take a random index. We check if that's in our current moles hash set, which would indicate it's active. If not, we add it to the hash set and activate it, passing in the level as a score divided by 10. This means we'll go up a level for every 10 moles hit. If that index was in use, we don't bother to keep trying until we get one or anything more complex, we simply let it wait until the next frame or we'll try again. For this to work, we need a way of when clicking on a mole to remove it from our hash set. For this, we'll need two methods. Add score for when we've successfully got the mole and missed for when we didn't. In the add score method, we take the mole index, update our score, give ourselves some extra time as a bonus and remove the mole from the hash set. In the missed method, we take two parameters, the index so we know which mole it was, but also if it was a mole. Because if it is a mole, then we want to add a time penalty, taking away two seconds from the time. If it was a bomb, then we don't want to do this as clicking on bombs is bad. In either case, we want to remove it from our current mole's hash set. So back in the mole script, we start by adding a reference to our game manager. We'll add an extra variable called mole index, so they each know which mole they are. We add a set index function to assign this. In the game manager, we can populate this by calling the method in start game when we're also hiding the moles. For missing our moles, this happens if the show hide coroutine reaches the end, because we stop it on a mole hit. So there we can call the missed method in the game manager. For the missed method, we want to pass one if it's a mole and zero if it's a bomb. In C sharp, like other languages, false maps to zero and true to one. So we can use an equality test to do this for us. As we have multiple types of mole, it's easy to compare it with a bomb. So if it's a bomb, this will evaluate to false and zero, otherwise it'll be true and one like we want. When we click on a mole, that's handled in the on mouse down, and the two instances where we change the sprite to the hit sprite, we can also add in the add score calls. Finally, when clicking on a bomb, we can call the game over method, this time passing in one to indicate it was from a bomb. We need to assign all the references. So first the play buttons on click. We'll drag in the game manager object and set this to the start game method. And for each of the mole objects, we assign the reference to the game manager. We could have found this in a wake or used a static instance, but for a simple game like this, there's nothing wrong with manually passing in the reference. Just be aware, assignments like this aren't saved in the prefab, which is why we have to do it for each of them. Similarly, we need to assign things to the game manager. We add our play button and each of the nine moles. Again, we could have created code to find all the moles at runtime. I'm just being lazy at this point. That should all be working now. Here's the game in action. That's working great. The only oddity is that at the end of the game, the final few moles carry on and you can still click on them at that point. So in the mole script, we'll add a public stop game method where we make sure we can't hit the moles. We stop all the coroutines to stop the animations. In the game manager, we call this for each mole when the game over the method is called. Great. Now when we finish a game, everything pauses and that looks much better. The final thing we'll add on is some UI elements so you can see the score, timer and a game over message. The first thing we'll do is change the canvas scaling to scale with the screen size so our UI remains a constant size. I tend to use 1920 by 1080 as my reference. You can use whatever you want. The version I'm using of Unity now defaults to the Text Mesh Pro text elements, and I like to do the UI placement in the game view so we can see how everything will look together. First, we'll create the score header. We'll anchor that to the left by holding Alt as we click on the alignment, and we'll increase the width to 300 and center the text, which we'll set to score, and we'll just offset this above the horizontal by a little bit. I'll duplicate this to create the score text, modify the offset to put it below the header, and we'll increase the size of both of these to get something we like. Now we'll duplicate both of these to create the time elements, which we'll put on the right. When we anchor them and set the position by holding Alt again, we'll need to reset our Y offsets. Set the time header to time,
and we'll use a minutes colon seconds for our time display. Don't forget to rename things appropriately. We'll parent all four text elements within an empty game object called game UI so we can easily show and hide them. We'll set the aspect ratio to free aspect in our game window and drag it out. As you can see, when we resize it, the UI text is being resized and placed accordingly. Next, we'll add the text for game over when we run out of time. This time we want a bit larger text, and I'm going to stretch the game object across the screen, making sure again to center it. We'll apply a Z rotation of 16 and have these at a jaunty angle, and change the material preset to drop shadow and a color to a yellowy gold so they're easier to see. Finally, we'll duplicate this for our bomb message. and we'll disable our two game over messages and the game UI parent object so they're not shown at the start. So in our game manager script, we'll add references to these UI text elements. The game UI and the game over elements, we take the references to the game object as we just want to show and hide these. The time and score text, we reference the text mesh pro component because we want to update these values as we go. In our start game method, We'll ensure the game over text is hidden and the game UI is visible. When we set the score, we also want to reset the score text. In the update method, we update the time text each time. We represent this as minutes colon seconds. A D2 ensures we have two digits for the seconds always. Note here that we also force time remaining to zero if it's less than zero, so you don't see a negative time when you run out. The score text is updated in the add score function when you increment the score. And finally, in the game over method, if it's of type zero, we display the out of time message. And if it's of type one, we display the bomb message. We just have to assign all these UI elements to our game manager object. That's it. The game is now all working. There are lots of ways that you could modify this going forwards. You could add new mold types or objects, different arrangements of holes to make it harder with more holes. Or on the graphics side, you could animate the mold sprites when they appear perhaps add some particles when you successfully hit them. Finally, on the UI side, some feedback by the moles of the score and time gained on success or time lost when you miss them would be good. I hope you found this tutorial useful in some way. As ever, the full code is available on GitHub and I've put a link in the description below. If you have any requests for the Let's Create series, please let me know in the comments. See you next time.